a, a writing that would take my good, and actually it's really the amount of time that we've been here, we could dedicate uh, to this, as I wrote up here somewhat jokingly, a short letter of exhortation, uh, which in that case I'm actually quoting the writer of Hebrews. At the end he calls it, I hope he can put up with this short letter of exhortation. Um, I'm, I'm sure I wasn't the only one in this century or then that thought, you call that short? <laughs> Um, who knows? Maybe they got another uh, at some other time, uh, and God found in his wisdom. Let's not include the long version. Um, right? But a short letter of exhortation, in some sense, this is actually a sermon. It, it may be actually better to call it a sermon than a letter. We'll still calling it a letter, right, I guess for practical purposes, but um, it is in many ways, and it reads like a sermon. It even begins in some ways like a sermon. Um, right? Now, in terms of authorship, this one, as I'm sure we've read in all our, you know, in our commentaries or in our Bible dictionaries or our Bible background uh, books, right, that we are not entirely sure who wrote this. Uh, the name Paul has been thrown out there. There are a few lists in the third and fourth centuries that actually had Hebrews embedded in the Pauline letters. I think there's probably a very good case that Paul wrote. It may be the best case. Um, right, Apollos has been thrown out about there primarily because we know he had been trained um, in Hellenistic uh, rhetoric. He'd been trained also in Greek philosophy, right? And we know right from when he appears in the book of Acts, uh, he seems someone who's very well trained in teaching about Jesus and the Jewish scriptures. So I suppose it's entirely plausible that it's him. Uh, and a few have, you know, have, have made that suggestion. Barnabas has been yet another. The whole while, all of the suggestions have been about, is there someone who's sufficiently trained in Greek philosophy, especially Platonic philosophy, who knows it well, because this Greek is extremely sophisticated compared to most of the New Testament. In fact, I suppose besides Luke, is that fair to say, Steve? Yeah. Um, uh, like besides, besides Luke, it is, it is by far the most elegant and sophisticated of the bunch. Um, so the person who wrote it most certainly knew their stuff and must have received significant training in Greek rhetoric um, and, uh, right, and in philosophy. Um, and I suppose that that's why it appeals perhaps to the, a Jewish Christian audience um, who would have to have had plenty of exposure um, to the entire storyline of the Torah. Okay, and that's what I have here, um, right? We know that this group has to have been familiar with the story of Abraham, the fact that he had been promised many nations, the fact that Moses had led the people, uh, right, the Hebrews, out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the desert, establish a tabernacle and covenant out in Sinai, right? And beyond that, wandered in the desert. All of those stories make an appearance and all actually hold together the, this, this sermon to the Hebrews. So the audience had to have been familiar with this stuff, okay? Um, they, they had to have known at least, at least the storyline. Maybe not in detail, but they most certainly knew plenty of it. Um, now, this group is incredibly embattled. I mean, they must be besieged on every side by quite a bit of persecution. Some of us, I know, actually told me stories that, you know, for them, Hebrews made a major difference in their faith. Uh, one brother here at, uh, in Philly, uh, Kurt Flinchbaugh, um, when I, I, t I spoke to him the other day, Kurt said that if it were not for this sermon to the Hebrews, he's not sure if he would be a Christian wow. uh, anymore. He said... It really, really kept me in the fight. And that's exactly how it reads, right, when you go through it. It's a, it's a letter that if you are down and out, if you feel yourself beaten on every side by all sorts of pressures and expectations, this is what you should read, okay? Um, and, uh, and that's what it seems like. Uh, in fact, you know, the very famous passage that we know well about not giving up in, a, in, right, in attending the meetings of the body. In the context of this letter, they, some of them stopped going to worship services. Any meetings, especially public meetings, some of them just stopped going because they were tired of facing that kind of pressure. Um, and some of them neglected going and meeting with the body because, primarily because they didn't want to identify with that group uh, and suffer as a consequence, okay? Um, but my good, there's reference to conversion of God's power. They were, he wants to appeal to them. Don't you remember your conversion? Don't you remember what happened when you first came to faith and you experienced God's power? It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, how easily I could forget the amount of things that happened. In fact, I mean, I'm not going to get into details here, but the amount of people that have <laughs> that asked me about kind of gang background and stuff like that when I was in Miami, I don't necessarily like to talk about that all that much, but the fact that it was brought up a couple of times, I, I can't say, no, I can't say that I appreciate 
how far God has brought me, okay, and saved me from death many, many times. You know, that, in that sense, I can, I can most certainly relate to the text here. When he, you know, when, when he told them, as it says here in 2.1, you know, we, it's necessary for us to pay more attention to what we have heard or else we may drift away from it. If the message that was spoken by angels was reliable and every offense and act of disobedience received an appropriate consequence, how will we ex ignore such a great salvation? The emphasis here is on great salvation. We've received a great salvation. Amen. And as hard as stuff gets, right, as we're growing as Christians, it never is, is proportionate to the, the power that God has shown to change our life. Um, so at least in recounting those stories of my past, I thought, it's true. I mean, I, I, I go and I visit my friends with whom I studied the Bible as much as I could before I left that area of Miami. And my goodness, they're barely making it. You know what I mean? And I, and I mourn for them, you know, because their life could be one of richness. They could be spreading so much life and goodness to other people, uh, but they barely made it, at least the ones who are alive, you know what I mean? Or not in jail or prison or something like that. You know what I mean? They've, they've um, you know, they still struggle. And I still instilled their friend. I stayed with a few of them, you know, a couple of years ago. And I could still see, wow, the same things that were their outlet to make them feel good about themselves is the same thing they still go to at 40 years old. You know what I mean? We're all older. <laughs> Um, than we were then, uh, but still going to the same stuff, running to the same relationships, going, still going to the clubs, still going at that age. And I thought, and they're like, you're the only one who's married with kids, you know, you're going to bait it up. I was like, it's God, thank you. Um, so it is good. Here He begins the letter by at least reminding them that. Um, but before he ever gets to that, that's more about the audience. Uh, when? It's interesting. Clement of Rome actually invokes this sermon to the Hebrews in 95, 96. A.D. in a sermon. So it most certainly was around wow. before that. That's a very, very early reference, yeah. right, to a writing that we've gotten. Um, and he also speaks, at least in the Greek, seems to speak in the present tense as ongoing sacrifices in the temple. So yeah. I don't think it's a, right, it, it makes sense that this is a pre-70 letter. Um, I imagine maybe in the mid-50s. Uh, in the 60s, I think a case can be made that this letter um, was, was, uh, was, was around uh, and circulating. Okay? Now, let's just start beginning to just that first verse, uh, which says a whole lot. Before we, I'm just actually then going to go into just four different panels. Uh, because of all the ways that you can divide the sermon to the Hebrews, there's many. I'm just going to break it down pretty much into four sections. One to two, three to four, five to seven, eight to ten. Uh, and then this, this, the, 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 conclusion, the concluding part. Um, but I think those four panels do a good job of jumping through each of the Old Testament themes that form each of, each of the building blocks or bricks of the letter. Okay. Uh, and it actually takes them pretty much through a tour uh, of the most either important persons or events or institutions of the Jews. Okay? Um, before it gets to that, the purpose is laid out right there in the very first verse. Thank you, right, author to the Hebrews. In the past, God spoke to the prophets, to our ancestors in many times and in many ways. In these final days, though, he spoke to us through a son. God made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. The son is the light of God's glory and the imprint of God's being. He maintains everything with his powerful message. After he carried out the cleansing of people from their sins, he sat down at the right side of the highest majesty. And the son became so much greater than the other messengers, such as angels, that he received a more important title than theirs. You know, we've, we've repeatedly made these statements about the indicative precedes, right? The imperative. This is probably the, in, the indicative of this letter, with a capital I. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, even though there's plenty of other indicatives that come, it kind of unpacks. Why is this Jesus the greatest revelation of God's will and God's person than all of the previous ones, right? And that's what he unpacks. He says, all the many ways that people learned about God and drew near to God, this one is the greatest of all of those, right? And, uh, and, and, it's, and, and I put many pieces. This is another use of that word poly, polymedos, right? Poly is many. Um, and medos is this term of like little pieces, little parts. And he says, out of all the many pieces that God has thrown our way, uh, to know about him, this one puts them all together, right? Like a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, all the presentations that you made, right, after your exegetical exercise, uh, I guess there's exegetical and hermeneutical exercise, in all of those, all of you did quite a job of trying, right, of connecting 
some of the themes of the Old Covenant and especially the redemption of people in the Old Covenant to what God eventually fulfilled in a much more permanent and greater fashion in Jesus. That's exactly what, the God, right, what, what this letter to the Hebrews is about. Why is Jesus so much better? Um, than all of these others. That, that is, what does it do in fulfillment of what came before it? Okay? We got that? Right? And notice there's two very powerful metaphors. Jesus, Jesus is to God what the radiance of the sun is to the sun. Right? So when you see and you, you feel it out there, right? I mean, when you think of all the rays of light touching every single thing out here now, and all that's emanating from one source, right? Yeah. Which is thousands upon thousands of miles away. So it's comparing Jesus is all the rays of it. It's the radiance and the rays that comes upon everything for this, right, what is to the Father. And then it says that he's the exact imprint. Uh, and there it's comparing the signet ring, right? The signet ring has itself a little pattern. It sticks itself on the wax seal. And then when you lift it up, boom, right, it matches the signet ring. So it says that Jesus is that, right? He's that, he matches the God being the signet ring and the wax seal being Jesus. He bears the imprint. See, so that it, it becomes a very visceral, right, and tangible example of, oh, wow, Jesus is himself an embodiment, right, uh, of God um, in the world for us. Therefore, it sort of sets out right at the beginning, I know all of you are struggling, but this Jesus is worthy of our trust and our devotion the word better and lasting is already right in the background of all of this. The word better and lasting appears I don't know how many times, <laughs> uh, many, um, I imagine at least 10 or 15. I didn't count it actually in preparation for this. Uh, better and lasting appears many, very, very often in Hebrews. It's a very much of a thematic word of the entire sermon. So who is he better than at first? The angels, including the little chubby ones with the wings <laughs> that you see. <laughs> That you see in all the precious moments, <laughs> cardstock, uh, and letters, and all that stuff, right? It's pretty amazing that we've inherited that and multiplied it and right, propagated it in every, every corner of the earth as our images of angels, as little fat babies. Um, which in many ways is probably closer to pagan. In fact, uh, two weeks ago I was at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and there's a sarcophagus there. Um, I also, in fact, I have a picture here of the Emperor Caligula that's there. Um, but there was a sarcophagus uh, surrounded by these little fat babies um, all the way around um, and it actually it was it was a, a gentleman was buried in there and all of these little little babies um, were I imagine these are early images from which we take our cues of these babies they were all little babies of Eros um, and, uh, and 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 one of the babies is holding a pitcher of I'm guessing wine pouring it straight into the mouth, and I guess this baby represents Dionysius of some kind, and he's pouring wine into the mouth. So the person who was buried there was meant that, oh, Eros, he says, you're going to enter hopefully a place of union, right? We're kind of serving you up uh, to the god of pleasure, and that, which is fairly interesting and unique sort of thing to see in burial practices of the time. Um, but I remember when I looked at the baby, it was funny, my, my daughter, I was there with my kids, just with, my, with three of my kids, and they were going around copying, drawing stuff. And I said, oh, that's from the Bible. Oh, that, you see that in the Bible, and so forth. And they're like, that looks, and my son said, look, all the little angels. You know, and I said, look, well, that's kind of interesting that that image of the angel, not just, you know, primarily it's of the messenger, right, of God, who does God's will. Whether the little nude babies with the little wings, I don't think so. Um, but anyway, it's important to get through that, that misconception. Um, for some of us to think, I, it's not hard for me to think of Jesus being better than that. Um, but uh, there's, uh, there's actually a typo there with the, uh, the Deuteronomy um, reference, so I'll, I'll correct that. But it was known to those people that the angels mediated the delivery of the covenant right, tablets to Moses. Because a direct interaction between Moses and God was considered to be, well, life-threatening, um, right, at the least. But something to become in, in contact with God's holiness in that event uh, was not pop. So, so they, the, it, was, it was very often interpreted that the angels delivered this, right, uh, to them. And in Deuteronomy, that's, that's made clear. So he says, if Jesus brought forth, as it says, right, and I read that part actually to you in, in the beginning here. If Jesus himself was declared, you know, was declared, d delivered a message as God's son. How much greater is this message? Right, if this is coming from the Son, um, 
Right? And that's what I read before. If the message that was spoken by angels was reliable, and they received that law, took it, Moses took it down the mountain, it became the basis of their covenant with God. Look what happened in the ensuing years in the desert. God expected them to follow this and trust him. And they all died. Virtually an entire generation of people died on their way. Something that they could have done in a couple of months. Forty years, an entire generation of those Jews died. Right, that originally came out. So he says, if those folks didn't trust that message and died as a, as, a, as a result, what about the one that comes from the sun? Right, so he said, and that one was delivered by angels. You know, by little fat babies, you know? <laughs> anyway, but he says, if it's coming from the sun, how much more important is it for us to pay attention? So I'm sure that at the beginning of this sermon, he caught their attention. Okay, <laughs> all right, we got you. You know what I mean? He's greater than the angels, and so is the message that he brings. Okay, there's obviously another great, um, as you keep reading through this, it's, you know, it makes clear in verses 5 through 9 that this Jesus is not just greater than the angels, because I think the immediate impression is that, oh, if he's greater than the angels, he's somehow, like we almost start to think he's like Superman. Yeah. Um, he's the beast. Well, everything that ensues from 5 to, t to 9 is to show that this is a human, this, this is, he was a human being who actually was willing to suffer just like you and I and live a life from the very beginning all the way to the very end to death. So you, we cannot ever say that God did not taste everything a human being tasted. He was in a womb just like all of us. And he tasted death just like all of us would in some fashion or another. Hopefully he'll come back. Who knows, right? But there's no way that he could say that God did not taste everything from beginning to end. He was a fetus in a womb. He had to go through the birth canal. He was a little snot-nosed punk, falling over stuff, who knows what, right? You know, sometimes, you know, we don't like, in fact, a lot of people in the ancient, late ancient world did not like the fact that we didn't have any details about Jesus' upbringing. I find that quite inspiring. He was an ordinary kid, I suppose, right? Notwithstanding everything that was released was the movie Young Messiah that came out a few months ago. Try, anyway, it takes excuse from some of those early infancy gospel right, and those writings, um, right, the kind of pseudepigrapha that try to give you, fill in the gaps. Oh, this is how Jesus was like when he was five. This is how Jesus was like in kindergarten. You know, this is that, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, he's healing birds and setting, and stuff like that. Um, and, and, but the fact that there's nothing there in the gospels about his early life, with the exception of what, right, what happens when he shows up at the temple with his parents, is to tell us that he was just like us. It's nothing, right? That's it. It was just like us. And he went on his life, his adult life. He actually lived somewhat more so than the average individual of that time. Uh, read, read recently of some work by Dale Allison, which he, uh, he, he, uh, he looked through the average age on the epitaph gravestones of folks in that area, <coughs> uh, mostly in the Mediterranean, of that era. The average age he said he could come out was 28.5 years of age. Wow. And, uh, and he said that the Greek word that appeared more often than any other in those epitaphs was too soon. Wow. Gone too soon. And the amount of people who died, mid-20s, late-20s. I mean, that's it, what's remarkable. You, you found someone, and a, a few days before I came here, I watched a National Geographic show of some folks who, they, uh, they reconstructed the body of a shepherd, some sort of shepherd type that they found out in, Ju in, in Judea. And they, they established that this is a 44-year-old man. I mean, this, and they said this man would have considered it old. He would have been considered up there, an elder. And they could even reconstruct that he had all his teeth missing. I mean, the, the, I'm sure the oral hygiene would have been horrible at the time. He, had, he was already missing all of his front teeth from deep infection. And they could even see through the remains of his mouth that the infection had reached up into his jawbone and above. Oh, wow. um, you know, anyway, but it was a harsh, hard time to live, right? You know, you could imagine what the message about being received, right, being delivered from death, and that God would come in flesh and live the entire full human journey from birth to death. It has some palpable, right? It has a result that really hits people in the heart. You know, in our generation, we keep pushing the frontiers of death farther and farther out. At that time, you hear that message when you're 15, you know, who knows if you're going to make it? It makes it very, very, very real. Right? Whereas to us, we do very much live in a culture, in fact, it's a verse that's quoted here, right, that Jesus delivered those who lived in fear of death, right? 
um, delivered him from the power of the one who holds him in bondage to the fear of death. But anyway, the whole idea here is to just make it clear to ourselves that Jesus was very much a human being. And God showed himself not just that he was greater than the angels. And this is almost you know, kind of a very interesting com right, combination of ideas. He's greater than the angels, but he's just like you and me. Right? He's just like you, and he lived the entire full journey. That's something that we could very much share in our, in, our, in our life. When people think, oh, I'm detached from God. I don't see any relevance in God. I don't feel anything. He says, well, what about a God that knows your entire life? He knows what life is like. He's, in, he's incarnated in life and death. He's already been through death. Right? And even visited death. Right? That's something I think that has a great hat to hang on. Right? Um, and, and on top of that, right, he says... Even as, as that, he loves us as his brothers and sisters, right? That's the great part towards the end of chapter 2. Right there at the end of chapter 2, he says that he's not ashamed to call us all brothers and sisters, even though he went through literally hell for us on earth and below. <laughs> you know what I mean? And came up from it for our sake, right? So that, I think, would have very much warmed their heart. It would have pierced and warmed their heart when they first heard this. Well, he's greater than the angels, but he did everything we did. So he's not elevated way up there somehow, right? Sometimes the cosmic Christ is so above us, he seems like a robot. Yeah. Um, and it's good to bring that down to earth so that people can grasp it. Amen? Amen. So he's greater than the angels. The second person that, it, that the second image and institution is Moses in the promised land. And that's through Hebrews 3 and 4. All right? Moses in the promised land slash rest. Everything, right, from that, uh, more or less, all right, in that section of the text uses and relies on that part of the narrative to make its point about Jesus. Okay? And at the very beginning, therefore, brothers and sisters, uh, we have, uh, who are partners in the heavenly calling, think about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him, just like Moses was faithful in God's house. So it introduces Moses. Now they're like, oh, he's going with the big boys now. Angels, okay. But now he's introducing Moses. Moses is the great lawgiver, right? Really, arguably the greatest, right? Figure the most, you know, most, maybe, maybe the most respected of the bunch. I mean, this is the man of the Torah, right? The one who spoke to God face to face as a friend in the tent. Great respect. And boom, here it lays it out that, yes, Moses was a faithful servant in God's house. I think there is some echo here with 1 Samuel 2. Right when, you know, in, in, in kind of in disestablishing the house of Eli, he says, if there's going to be a house of God, there also has to be a faithful priest for that house. Um, and so there is already an introduction there that if God does not like what the house is doing and the priest in that house is doing, he will replace it by another. Um, and, and here, I think it plays off of that motif a good bit. And it says that Moses did it faithfully. He established a house in the desert for the people of God, right? Jesus, he says, is a son not just a faithful servant, but a faithful son in God's house. So if you're welcomed into that house, get right with that son. Because he's the one who's established it. Wow. Right? And at, from there, it makes it, the, the whole, uh, the, the running theme is the voice of God coming to the people where they are. The first, the initial story here is, and in fact, probably the most important one, I think I put it in there, Numbers 14 is a very important background to this, to this uh, section of Hebrews. Um, in fact, there, one of the tips that I'll give you for reading Hebrews is that when the Old Testament, if you're going to spend a good bit of time on it, that is, whenever there's an Old Testament allusion, read it. Go back and read it. It's unbelievably eye-opening um, as far as how much light it sheds on the passage in Hebrews. Just go back and read the Old Testament passage. So here, I think Numbers 14 is very, very important, okay? Um, and, it, and, and it's definitely worth reading, okay? Um, I think, I mean, there's three episodes at least that probably all work into this. The Masa, Meribah, Kadesh, Barnia, right? All those three where they were tested in the desert, um, right? Here, Numbers 14, I think, is, is key. Uh, and in all of these passages, the word of God comes to them while they're in trial in the desert. So, of course, it applies to their situation. Hey, your ancestors were being tried in the desert. So now you do feel the test, right, in this desert. What are you going to do now? Are you going to listen to his voice or not? Right? And the entire theme of Hebrews 3, right, is about that. Right? Look, look at 3.7. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, don't have stubborn hearts as they did in the rebellion. Right? In Numbers 14. Then later on. 
Look at verse 14. We are partners with Christ, but only if we hold on to the confidence we had in the beginning until the end. When it says, what does it say? Today, if you hear his voice, don't have stubborn hearts as they did in the rebellion. There's that repetition that we had talked about in exegesis. Clearly, the emperor is, as you're being tested in the desert, just as Moses was with his people, he expects each generation of God's people to write, write to anew, hear the voice of God. Right, which is, I think even saying some of the things, you know, that we, I'm very deeply encouraged by the amount of youngsters, you know what I mean, your age that are here. Some of the stuff that you shared when you were up here, I don't remember when I figured that out, but I was years as a disciple of Jesus, you know. When, and some of you are, are, that is your grasp of some of the promises and the goodness of God is stuff that I didn't get. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't reach any of that stuff at that age uh, as a disciple. So it's promising to hear that from you. Right. Having said that, you also each have to make a decision for the sake of your generation of people to hear God's voice in you and respond faithfully. Yeah. Right? And that, that's part of this. Right? It says, they heard it in the desert. Look at the result. The following generation, they heard it again. They had to respond. They couldn't rely on uh, the people back then. They weren't faithful. Or the people in the previous generation, they were faithful. My mom, my dad, my grandparents. Right? You know how it works. Yeah. Um, Right? That's, and there's still a lot of people in the United States that rely on the fidelity of their previous generation to establish their own. In fact, that was probably the most prominent thing that I noticed you know, in the country, rural area that I've been living in for the past five years in Virginia. Everyone says they go to a church, but it's just a generational church. It's church, everyone where I lived in that rural area went to a church. Yeah. Unlike other places I've been to where nobody likes to go to church. Here, everyone says they're part of a church, but not really actively engaged as disciples of Jesus in them. Right. Right? Anyway, let's not repeat that error, which is exactly what this is saying. <laughs> okay? Let us not repeat that error. They came to them in the desert. It came to them as they were entering the promised land. Um, right? And that's the image of Numbers 14. As the people of God are in the threshold of entering the promised land or of entering rest, everyone has to make a decision. Will you follow God when you enter this land? When you go back to New York, Virginia, Puerto Rico, Right? Whatever, Dominican Republic, you name it. You have to respond as you're in the threshold to God's voice when it comes to you. Amen? That's what I think is clearest. And he says, I want you to press on to maturity. Please, he says, do not give up. Um, okay, we'll move on here to 5 through 7. Now, so it started with the angels. It goes to Moses in the promised land slash rest. And now it jumps over to the priesthood and the sacrifices. Right? And then primarily, really, the priesthood. Okay, so Jesus, he says, Jesus is greater than Moses. The word of Christ is coming to you. Right, this is, you know, in chapter 4 is where the verse that we know quite well, right, from 412, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Now you see the significance of the context of that passage. The word came to all those previous generations, and now it's still alive now. See? Um, that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, then... When you go to Hebrews 5 and 6, and it now jumps over to then the, the image of the priesthood, right? The priests were established by covenantal descent. You had to be a descendant of Aaron, right? To do that. To be a member, right? Especially the Levitical priesthood. I mean, nowadays you'll still meet Jews, right? Who's last name is Levine, right? Or Levinson. That's all, that's all derived from Le Levi. Okay, um, so those folks are from the line, in some way or another, of priests of Israel. Um, so these folks had to, you have to be of that line. Well, here it says Jesus, right? It, it goes through the, this process of making it clear every high priest is taken from the people and put in charge of things that relate to God for their sake. This is 5 1, in order to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. The high priest is able to deal gently with the ignorant and those who are misled, since he himself is prone to weakness. Because of his weakness, he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the people. No one takes this honor for themselves, but takes it only when they are called by God, just like Aaron. Now look what it does. In the same way, Christ also didn't promote himself to become high priest. Indeed, it was the one, it was the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And he's quoting there Psalm 110. This is Jesus is of a priesthood of a completely different order. This makes sense because Jesus is not a descendant of Aaron. Right? right? He's not a Levi. Okay? He's a descendant of Judah. He's from the tribe of Judah. 
So if he's going to be a priest, as it's been already mentioned even before we ever got to this section, that he's a faithful high priest, right? So he represents us to God and God right back. He stands in between the gap, right? He stands between us and God. And he's faithful. But he's not an Aaronic priest. He's not a Levitical priest, right, in any sh way, shape, or form. He's actually of a different order. And this order is of Melchizedek. Do you remember the story of Melchizedek, right, in Genesis 14? Abraham, of all people, offers him in tribute a tithe. And he's presented there also as a king of Salem. So here, the writer to the Hebrews says, Jesus, in carrying out his ministry and offering himself as a human being, on our behalf, he is not, it's, it doesn't make as much sense to place him in the order of the Aaronic priesthood. Yes, he experienced our weakness and our tests, but he was not ignorant and flawless, or even given to corruption, as many of, the, of course, them, of them were. And in fact, he's a priest king. And if Abraham, the great Abraham, offered him tribute, Right? And they believed, of course, you know, at that time that within the loins, right, in a sense, within the, 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 right, the ancestor, the rest of right, their descendants were contained. Right? So they, in many ways, they do believe that if Abraham offered up a tithe, so did subsequent generations, including Jesus. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, right? they, they, they believed, yes, it's present. But Jesus, even so, is of, a great, of another order. He's of the order of Melchizedek. He is eternally flawless and available to bring us into the presence of God. Yeah. All these other priests, it says here, if we were to keep on reading, have to enter the temple. They have to offer a sacrifice. But can people walk in there and beyond the curtain? Hey, let me look and have some time with God. No, you can't do that. I mean, the idea, of course, is that the high priest and Yom Kippur goes in, right? Pays the blood and the Holy of Holies, and then when he walks back out, he declares forgiveness to all the people. Right? The image, which will end up becoming a little bit more substantial as we read on, is that Jesus enters the heavenly temple, right? the one that apparently right, is right, the original, of which the one on the earth is the copy. He goes into the gut of that one, and he offers his own blood. Right? And in that way, he can bring all these people with him into the presence of God. Amen. Rather than always having to keep your distance. And only one person goes in. Right? Per year to gain forgiveness. Here he rips the whole thing open. As we know, right? That image of the torn curtain. Right? In Matthew. So everybody can go in and be close to God. See, so notice the argument that he's starting here. Right? He says, all of you are afraid and discouraged. I hear you. But we've got one who's greater than the angels. He became a human being. He's leading us, and he's built a house as a son which, into which we are welcomed. You know, and his voice is coming to you. Don't deny it. He's talking to you. Come on. And then here he says, and this one, he's luring you with his voice so he can take you to God. Wow. That's great. Right? I mean, that tugs on everything. Not just the heart strings. Whatever wherever else you have strings, it's tugging on those. <laughs> okay? Right? I mean, that, that's, that, that's very powerful. So then he takes it another step forward from Hebrews 8 to 10. He now goes, Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is the mediator wow. of a greater covenant. So notice how he keeps on upping the ante, right? He went through Moses and the promised land. He went through the priesthood and the sacrifices that it offers that don't do enough, right, to truly cleanse the hearts of the people and bring them to God, right? It did it for a purpose, and it set them up to know that God wanted them and wanted to be in fellowship with them. But Jesus, as in God's flesh, brings them into communion with God. Right? If that's the ultimate goal. That's why God, I mean, and that seems to make sense. Genesis 1, the goal is that God can walk around with us. How, I mean, that's terrific, isn't it? God just wants to walk in the same place we are. Right. The, the subsequent history of right, human history has been how we've separated ourselves from him and don't want to walk in the same place he is. Yeah. Right? So here he does it for us, in a sense, and he comes down, and I, I'm going to walk with you again, just like it was in Genesis 1 in the garden. Right, but here is a human being who can be slain. Right, but he's the better covenant and a better sacrifice. Right, there's a smaller section within there, 9.1 to 10.18. It wasn't, of course, a very clean separation um, of chapters. 
Leviticus 16, just like Numbers 14, is very important for right that the uh, the three through four. Here, um, Leviticus 16 is very important for understanding Hebrews 8 through 10, because there it goes through all of the rituals for the Day of Atonement. Right? He, the priest goes out, brings the goat over, puts his hands on the head, prays for the right for the prayers of the people. I'm not going to go through in Hebrew, but he prays over, the, over the, the head of this thing for God's forgiveness and the sins of the people. He backs off, they grab it, they're out to the city, and they push it on out to make sure he leaves. And it goes out there in the desert and dies. Okay? With the sins. They have to burn the offerings, right? Burnt offerings were supposed to be, they were burnt completely in order to show that this is a complete sacrifice and handing over of a life to God. Right? And in this case, it, it glorified the animal, the unblemished animal, to be given to God. Okay? Um, I mean, sometimes, I know I've, read, I've heard from some of you, gosh, how many animals do these people kill? <laughs> you know, on a daily basis. You know what I mean? The people from Pitta and, you know, and, and, you know, and, and, animal, and animal cruelty. You know, I've, I've talked to some people who are very touchy about that. I suppose it makes sense. Now, truth be told, when Solomon held right, that one festival, and said, I mean, it was obscene how many animals he sacrificed. Thousands of goats and oxen. That, that was way overboard. That was not, a, at least as far as I read it, right? I may be wrong. As far as I read that's that was not required. Let me just put it that way. That was not required in the Old Covenant. That wasn't required. He went so far beyond what you're supposed to do. I mean, there would have been rivers of blood all over the place with that, much de- with that much death. I mean, they were sacrificing animals all day. All right? Um, but the, 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 the way it's offered here is to you remember that this animal is carrying the sins of the people. It wasn't to dispose of it because it's a piece of trash. You realize that this is a living being that's carrying your sins with you. They're yours. When you see some, the slit throat of an animal in front of you, I hope it would sober us. Right? Yeah. I mean, some of you know, we, we've had animals that we've taken care of. Well, I always kill my hermit crabs and the birds you know, take care of and such like that. Now, yes, truth be told, as far as, you know, the concern involved may be relative, depending on what, what we own. But I know that all of us, it's hit us when we think, I, was, I, I wanted to take care of this animal and it died in my hands. Yeah. Now, it's dead. But it is still sobering. I'm saying, at least in a spiritual sense, we realize life does depend on us, right? And these things do depend on our own well-being for their life. And that's all it made clear to them. These things are dying. And maybe it was hearkening back to God making skins, right, for Adam and Eve. He, obviously, an animal had to be killed in order to cover up their bodies. I mean, so this is not anything new. Every single day, we eat something that had to die for us to live. We just ate a whole bunch of chickens, right? So, right, and all of that. It, it's, it's, it's a good and sobering, right, and heartfelt acknowledgement of what is take to keep us alive, right, and to be these faithful disciples that we are. So that's why we honor the food that we eat. That's why we honor these animals that give their life for us and that they offered, right, in, this, in a very similar fashion. This is not just done in some, like, perfunctory fashion. Hey, go ahead, get, 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 get it done so we can be forgiven. Although I'm sure it did reach that, that point. Right, so to offer this burnt offering was one that glorified the animal to God because they knew this is really, really significant for us. You know, we move forward with God because of this. And this is God's grace being shown to us already here Right, in the Old Covenant. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, we can meditate on that later. <laughs> okay, um, right, what's great about this Jesus of this sacrifice, as it says in 10, 11 through 14, I lost my place. As we come down here, 11 through 14, every priest stands every day serving and offering the same sacrifices over and over. Sacrifices that can't t- never take away sins. But when this priest offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right side of God. Since then, he's waiting until his enemies are made into his footstool for his feet because he perfected the people who are being made holy with one offering for all time. So that offering that went up to the nostrils of God, he says, this is the one that was needed. These, as they sometimes say, the sacrifice that ends all sacrifice. Right? This was it. Why, in the end, it leads to why would we reject such an offer? Right? Every section that introduces these kind of types from the Old Testament mm-hmm. is followed by a warning. If this message came from angels, why would you reject, right? And it came from, Je- it came from angels, you wouldn't re- want to reject. And it came from Jesus, why would we reject it? If Jesus established the house as a faithful son and, and rest, why would you not want to enter that, <laughs> right? If he is not just an order of a, of a priesthood that's corrupt and given to ignorance, right, and flaw, 
Why not receive a sacrifice from a priest who is not and who's always available? And then lastly here, he not only, he's, he's also the mediator of a better covenant. One from Jeremiah, right, 32. It's the law written in the heart of the human being, the spirit. And he's also given himself over for us. He entered that temple as a sacrifice. You know, sometimes you see that little diagram of, you know, the chasm with the cross, right? It says, how can we get from uh, here to God? We have this massive gulf. Have you ever seen that, right, in the, in the tracks? And it says, oh, but when you put the cross there, it has the, the cross beam of the cross, right, that, that forms a bridge between us, right, between us and God. Have you seen that? I don't know if you've ever yeah. seen that, that diagram before. What this more accurately replaced is that God went into that pit for us. <laughs> Not that he's waiting off on some other side. He actually went into that pit of hell for us so that we can get over to him. Right? Or at least maybe jumped into the pit and then back out of it to bring him. <laughs> Who knows, right? But you know what I'm talking about as far as that image is concerned. It's supposed to make us clear that, wow, this is an amazing, amazing sacrifice that he's offered up. So, in the end, okay, um, the, the, then the, the rest of the letter or sermon, I should say, as you can see, is very, very short. Um, is one that it, it makes a claim that now ask yourself about your faith and ask about your willingness to endure suffering. That's pretty much what it ends with. I mean, those are the last, it says in chapters, especially after chapter 10 into 11, right? We'd love that, don't we? The description of faith, right? It's the great hall of faith, um, right? All these heroes, so to speak, of the old covenant being brought out as examples of faithfulness, right? For all to marvel, which is true. All right, all those heroes of the faith are there. Noah is there being faithful with the impending disaster. Abraham is moving his life moving throughout that entire area as a sojourner um, with his eyes fixed on a promise of receiving a homeland in the future that he, ended, right, that he wanders through, but he never actually sees come to fruition. Joseph, of course, gives instructions about his own burial. It has that story there in 22. The story of, right, of Joseph, that is, of Moses, Right, choosing to follow and lead the people of God. All these heroes are brought up over and over again as being examples of faith. Right? And I have it up there. Right? Jesus is all of those things, so he's calling us to faith. I think faith can probably be broken down to those three components. Conviction, loyalty, and trust. Sometimes right, we talk to each other, oh, I'm lacking faith. Well, what of faith? Right? And I think those three things definitely apply. You're convinced of something. You want to be loyal to something and you want to trust. Every human being has to extend that to something and someone. Right? Sometimes we think I'm struggling in my faith and we keep it you know, kind of somewhat vague, but it may be that we're fine, we're convinced of Jesus and we're also, I'm with him, but I just do not trust mm -hmm. yeah. that he's looking out for my best. Yeah, come on. Uh, right? Yeah. Or I trust him. I do trust. I, I got to trust because I, I have nothing to control here. I have nothing to control, so I, I trust. And I know I need to be committed to something because if I'm not, then I'm wishy-washy and I'm all over the place. But maybe I'm just not convinced of who he is. Wow. Okay, so I know I got to be loyal and I know I should trust. I'm just not convinced. It's good, right? You know what I'm saying? It's good to shore up these aspects of our faith. To ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves the hard questions and get help right, through our own discipling and through our own study and prayer and prayer with others. Right, one of these three, and we can shore up all three of these, our faith is very much strengthened. Amen? Amen. And I think that's the end right, of it. In the end, it just says, look, follow these great models of faith. Stay close to Jesus. Go out to him. Right? The sacrifices that were being offered, especially in Yom Kippur, were done outside of the city. Right? It ends in, 13, right, in, the, in chapter 13. Go out to him. Go out to Jesus. Go find him. Okay? Go out to him, and, and, you, will, and, and you will right, find all of these promises that were given to him to be, to be true, right, that he will care for you, he will bring you to God. Uh, he may be outside of the city in the place of shame, right, it says in verse 12, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy with his own blood. It says, go out there, and it says, even bearing his shame, it says, in chapter 13, right, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful passage. Right in verse 3, remember prisoners as if you were in prison with them, and people who are mistreated as if you were in their place. Wow. Everything there from the beginning of chapter 13 to the end is modeling Jesus was willing to take up the shame that we carry. Let's do the same. We know people who are in prison. 
Imagine praying as if you were there with them. Yeah. Right? There was a brother in the church that I was in this past night. He was, he was convicted and sentenced to 10 months in jail uh, for something he did a year and a half before, prior to becoming a Christian. And it was pretty serious. Um, he had changed so much that when I went to his hearing, I and another brother went to his, went to his hearing, and we saw him shackled and taken, up, taken away. Wow. He was very humble. But the victim's parents had written a letter saying, please do not send this young man to prison. Wow. Because we can already see that he has changed his life. Wow. Um, wow. And asked for mercy and said, and, and if you send him to prison, please don't send him away from here. So that he can have these friends that apparently, right, these people that are with him nearby. So we were able to go every single weekend to go see wow. him there. Wow. Um, and he was a shining light in that jail. I mean, he was assaulted and threatened very often, and he never retaliated. You know, he would say he was there humbly when I'd, we'd go and study with him, even though those phones never stinking work. But anyway, I was like, <laughs> we'd be like, we're screaming, you know, to get the pass, you know, through the phone line, even though he's a foot away. Um, you know, and we'd, be like, we'd eventually just laugh because we'd be hoarse from a 20 minute conversation because they'd yell on the phone. But he was, say, he was so good hearted, even though he went through serious struggles yeah. in that whole thing. Wow. But I remember, you know, when we would go in the meeting area and waiting area, I think, man, I wonder, I want to feel what he feels, you know, and he said, I feel you guys. I know you're here with me, Amen. you know, and I'm carrying that message with me here. Mm. Wow. You know, it was a great, great, great experience of unity and of God's love. So that faithfulness that's shown in Hebrews is very evident in our lives. We avail ourselves to it. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. That's cool.